In analysis and modeling, you're leveraging in-kind expertise, if not real dollars, from university expertise all the way around. You don't have to spend the money on staff. You're getting that for free. Or these university folks want to work on your data because it's interesting, and they will bring their funds with them. The same thing with uh, producing um, and publishing uh, the results of research. Uh, funding agencies, impressed by it, will be more inclined to give you dollars in your next proposal, follow on consortium projects. And in training university partners, uh, training you in grant writing, uh, technical workshops, field expeditions, can come with funding from the outside. And if you are, as I said, a member and working with national multilateral facilities, you'll be much more competitive for informatics funding. That's it. That's just some examples. Any questions? Any discussion? Great, thank you. Oh, Selwyn. Um, we had an information architecture workshop early in the year, and one of the greatest challenges that we identified was the fragmentation mm -hmm. at an international level, the fragmentation mm -hmm. of the sphere, the various initiatives. Right. And the difficulty of finding that common golden thread that one can weave through them that would have a kind of systemic impact at the national level. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that goes back to the issue of partnerships and funding um, so that, you know, you don't seem like you're promoting a fragmented approach at the national level. The question I have, is there any initiative at a global level that's looking at the alignment of this big EOLs, GBIF, Eyeball, all of them, that could support national implementation? Uh, that's a politically sensitive question, I think. The standard answer you get from the international multilateral folks, uh, the ones that we have presented here are good at going to a lot of meetings, is that the CBD is that form or that IPES uh, will be that forum. And that in some ways, uh, GBIF is because it works with a lot of these folks. My own view is that there isn't any international organization that actually coordinates them. No initiative. Or there's no initiative that coordinates all of them. The, the, the current multilateral organization use these individual organizations, uh, provide some funding for them. And individually, I would say, you have to be really realistic. Uh, if I was going to be brutally honest, I would say, when it comes to the competition for dollars and resources, or euros and resources, or rands and resources, the different, uh, that alphabet soup out there, will eat your lunch to get funded. That's experience. Yes. So on the surface, everybody's friendly and everybody's collaborating. Underneath that surface, they're sharks. Survival. That's right. Mm -hmm. So choose your partners carefully. Um, make your partnerships a win-win. And in a sense, I'm happy there is no global initiative to unite all these. A, they would settle for the consensus, in other words, the lowest common denominator. Uh, B, I think it's much better than having a top-down approach to organize things, is to have a bottom-up approach. A few uh, critical consortia can accomplish a lot more, a lot faster, than a top-down approach. I mean, look what Korea has done. It's a bottom-up approach. It bubbled up from the bottom. Look what Canabio did, bubbling up from the bottom. Um, the Biodiversity Institute, bubbling up from the bottom, and others. Sandby, bubbling up from the bottom. Um, 
Choose your partners carefully. Trust them. Make sure that for each one of them, it's a win-win to remain in the consortium and they're not tempted to um, uh, be selfish. So in many ways, consortia is like the tragedy of the co or the success of the commons, where everybody, if everybody pitches in and nobody is greedy, then everybody gets more. No, no thanks. I think I mean what you what you're saying is of course what I'm thinking because very often and what happens and, and I can speak from my from Sam's example and I suppose it's, it gets replicated in other African countries is that these international initiatives come and want to partner. Right. And very often you don't have a position from which to negotiate as to is it important, is it not important? And the reason why is that you haven't mapped up mapped out your institutional boundaries as to say what it is that you would like to achieve. Right. Who are the strategic partners that you engage with? Right. Um, and I think we're building institutions that can be very, very important to kind of have a strategic approach to your partners so that you know where you're getting your funding and making sure that there's mutually beneficial relationships. Right. And that you don't end up diffusing your energy and exactly. resources simply because... So question, question one when you get, and we get these offers all the time, question one is, will it serve your core mission? If the answer is yes, go for it, uh, all other things being equal. Question two, if it doesn't serve your core mission, is it an opportunity that can't be missed, that down the road might end up serving your core mission or evolve your core mission? And question three, if, if you're going to do number two, is if I participate, Will it diminish how well I can accomplish my, will it take resources from my core mission? Will the partnership provide enough resources so I can keep doing both? Uh, if the answer is no, then one should say thank you, no, because the core mission is more important than that, that project. Well, thanks. Ah, Joseph. The way I see with partnership, like at a national level, yes, it's very hard to fight partners who have your interests. They have their own interests. Yes. And in most cases, like my organization, what happens when we want partner? It's a matter of using our own staff to go there, stay there for, for some period, if it means uh, collecting information. You just go there at your, your own expense so that they go to that organization yes. for the relevant information which serves your interest. Yes. That way it is better than just telling them to, to be providing information for our behalf. Correct. For your own staff there, to stay there for six months or one year. There are many ways, relevant right. I think there are many ways to form a partnership. One is, uh, is to convince the partner you need that it's a win-win situation. It improves their lot as it improves your lot. And, and it's, you're not just using them, or they're not just using you, but that you are both going to benefit. It has to be mutually beneficial. It has to be a symbiosis. And the second, there are many ways to do that. You can embed a staff member in that unit, or they can embed, you can say, okay, take one of, Lucy can say, for example, um, we would love to have one of your researchers on beetles in our institution for the next six months, because we would like to do a project on beetles. We welcome you to work here with our folks. And the university may be willing to do that as a win-win. Um, because then they can tell the government, see, we're helping the government uh, do a project on beetles and it, it works out for them. It's a win-win. Um, that kind of exchange and, and, and you know, temporary embedding of an exchange of staff is great. Third, at a university, I think some of the best agents of collaboration are students. Because students haven't been siloed yet. They're much more open-minded. They're, uh, they're much more willing to kick ass uh, and, and accomplish challenges. And, and they don't have any patience for 
um, being siloed. And, and so if you can all, if you could at all use students as your agents of collaboration, that then will trickle up to the faculty members.